So all, all the people from USA, of course, will not connect because it's night for them. Sure. Oh. But some of them are working, you know, up to the very. Yeah, I was I was surprised that uh, they would rather prefer. To. Mm -hmm. So we start at 8.50, okay, Christoph? Okay, okay. So that we have two minutes. Okay, Christoph, uh, will we start? Sure. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Rosario Fazio, and together with Christoph Zaha, who will say uh, a few words just uh, is here. Uh, you can see him. Uh, we are organizing this, uh, this conference, and we really hope that uh, uh, you will enjoy. I mean, we are very excited about about it. So let me uh, just spend a few words about uh, some technical aspect which might be uh, useful. By default, when you connect, uh, you are muted. So if you want to ask questions or during the talk or after during the after the <clears throat> the talks, please raise your hands. Uh, this is something you will uh, see in. Uh, under the, the icon of reactions. If you ask, uh, if you raise the hand, uh, then I will ask to unmute. And if you authorize, then you have uh, the possibility to speak. Uh, in order to <clears throat> give the chance to everybody, everybody to interact, please, I will ask uh, the speakers to keep their talk in time so that we have also some time for discussion. Now, uh, on top of this, today, as you know, the, the talk by Wilczek will also be a colloquium. For technical reasons, a colloquium uh, being open also to participants that are not in this conference will be uh, uh, given under a different ID, Zoom ID. But, and I'm, I know that you already received the, all the information. So this afternoon it will work like that you first connect to the colloquium and then uh, you can use this uh, Zoom ID for the, for the afternoon session. Now, 
about the poster session, uh, the poster session will uh, be arranged as follows. The few breakout rooms equal to the number of posters will be created. They will carry the name of the uh, poster presenter. So the, all the presenters will find themselves uh, in the right, uh, so they will choose the right uh, room and they will uh, show the posters and all the participants can uh, move uh, uh, through the waiting room, uh, through the various breakout rooms uh, to see as much, as many posters as they like. Uh, I think it's about it. If you have uh, additional question, please either write me or Christoph in the chat or uh, by email and we will try to fix an answer to, the, to our best. And then I just leave the, the floor to Christoph for his remarks. Christoph, go ahead. Okay, uh, <coughs> thank, you, thank you, Rosario. I would also like to welcome everybody uh, and, and to my best knowledge, this is, this is a second conference exclusively dedica dedicated to, uh, to time crystals. The first conference was organized in Krakow two years ago, and the field of time crystal is developing. And in the few days, uh, we will see uh, uh, what is the status of the research on time crystals and, and in what directions it is, it is going. And of course, it's a pity that we cannot meet in person. I regret the more that Trieste is a beautiful place and I would be happy if I could visit Trieste again. So I wish you all an interesting conference and thank you. So <clears throat> thank you, Christoph. Uh, I think we can uh, right away start with the fir first speaker of this morning, uh, this session. Uh, Professor uh, Peter Hannaford. So if you may share the screen, I think uh, we can start with. Uh... With your talk. Yes. OK, please. How is that? Perfect. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, this is uh, coming to you from deep down under in Melbourne, where it's presently uh, seven o'clock in the evening. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by just thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward very much to the exciting program uh, ahead of us. Um, so, this is a collaboration between uh, two theory groups, uh, Christoph Giegel, Christoph Sacker from Krakow, and Zha Wang, Brian Dalton from Swinburne University in Melbourne. And with our experimental group, or our experimental time crystals group in Melbourne, uh, Tien Tran, Ali Zahir, Aparna Singh, Shamali Gunawadana, and, and Andre Sidorov. So, um, following on, following from Frank Wilczek's landmark paper proposing a quantum time crystal, Christoph Sacker proposed that a periodically driven um, many body system can reveal spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, of discrete uh, symmetry to form a discrete time crystal that evolves with a period longer than the period of the drive. Uh, as an example, I'll just uh, as an example, he uh, considered a BEC bouncing resonantly on an oscillating mirror uh, so that the period of the bounce was a, an integer uh, of the period of the drive. So, um, this was followed by proposals, theoretical proposals in Princeton, uh, Santa Barbara and Berkeley uh, based on driven spin systems. 
And then there was experimental evidence for discrete time crystals and spin systems, as we all know from Maryland, uh, from Chris Munro's group, and then in Harvard from Michelle Lucan's group. Um, this was followed by uh, further evidence in NMR experiments in, uh, in Pune and in Yale. Uh, in addition to this, uh, is the work in Utrecht uh, on super, superfluid Bose-Einstein condensate. Very recently, there have been some papers that have appeared on driven dissipative systems from Riverside, California, uh, from uh, Hossein Tahiri, who I think who will be speaking later at this conference, and also from Hamburg, uh, Andreas um, Hemmerich, who will also be speaking. So just coming back to the bouncing BEC system, which is yet to be realized experimentally, um, we can have, the motivation is we can have dramatic breaking of discrete time tra translation symmetry to give the possibility of uh, having big time crystals, meaning uh, S between perhaps 20 and 100. Um, having a large value of S allows a large drop height, uh, which allows precise measurements of the possibility, uh, measurements of the position probability density of the bouncing atom cloud. So it actually makes the experiment easier to have a, a large S. Also provides a, a flexible platform where you have say 20 to 100 lattice sites in time for studying uh, various condensed matter phenomena in the time domain, such as uh, Anderson localization, many body localization, where, where you have temporal disorder rather than spatial disorder. So we'll just talk for a while about big time crystals where S is large compared with two. Um, we start with a BEC of ultra cold atoms bouncing on a hard wall potential mirror uh, with strong transverse confinement, uh, omega perpendicular. And we work in gravitational units, um, for example, for potassium 39, uh, the gravitational unit of length is 0.647 microns in time, 0.256 milliseconds. And uh, if we transform to the oscillating frame and use action angle coordinates, the single particle effective Hamiltonian uh, simplifies down to this form. Um, and the driving, for example, for the case of S equals 40, uh, the driving give you 40 resonance islands, I only show 10 of them here, go out further, multiplied by four uh, in phase space, 40 resonance islands in phase space caused by the driving of the mirror, the oscillating mirror. In addition, um, we have a band structure from this effective Hamiltonian, or at least the quantum version of this, you can get band, you have band structure of the quasi energy levels where we have the lowest energy band, it's actually, uh, drawn higher here, that's because of the negative effective mass. Um, and we have a gap delta E. Uh, we try to operate in the regime where the, um, the gap, the energy, <clears throat> per, the average energy per particle is small compared with this uh, energy gap. So we're always operating in this lowest band region. So that was the single particle case. In the many body case, such as in a BEC, um, within the mean field approach and for uh, the average energy per particle, small compared with the band gap, solutions of the gross padevsky equation can be expanded in terms of these localized Vanier states. Uh, and this results in the mean field energy functional, um, which is really sort of a Bose Hubbard in time, where the tunneling rate is given by the following. This is all pretty familiar from Bose Hubbard model and the interaction energy U here. Uh, I should say that the interaction is characterized by this G times N. So the lowest energy solutions of this mean field energy functional, um, we've been pl plotted here showing the occupational probabilities of the 
uh, localized Vania wave packets. This is for the case S equals 40. So we have 40 Vania packets here. Uh, and it's calculated for different values of the interaction where uh, the critical value um, for breaking uh, time translational symmetry is, uh, is minus 0.0016. As we increase um, the interaction, uh, this is an attractive interaction in this case, um, the number of occupied Vania states uh, get smaller and smaller and still at this value of Gn equals minus 0.12, uh, it's all the occupation is in one single Vania state. So um, it's not really possible to prepare the condensate in a single uh, S equals four flow case state. This is a superposition of uh, 40 localized Vania wave packets, which is a Schrodinger cat state, uh, with moving with different velocities and different phase, different mutual phases. Um, this uh, is really not possible to prepare. On the other hand, we can just have a, for a sufficiently strong interaction, in this case, uh, Gn equals minus 0.12. This is a symmetry broken state. This becomes a single localized wave packet occupied by all the atoms. And this can be realistically prepared in the lab. So uh, the mean field calculation for the formation of a discrete time crystal. Um, this shows with time evolution, uh, the overlap here with the Vania, the Vania state with the wave function. Um, in the case of, of uh, zero interaction, it quickly decays like so. This is due to tunneling, strong tunneling between the wave packets, uh, between the initially populated wave packet and neighboring wave packets. Whereas uh, when the interaction is say minus 0.12, there's no sign of decay, at least out to 500 mirror oscillations. Uh, looking at this in, uh, in the spatial, domain from the mirror here up to uh, the turning point. In the case of uh, no interaction, you have many states populated here, plenty of states populated, whereas uh, when we have uh, interaction of 0.12, all the population is in this single Vania state here, which uh, oscillates backwards and forwards. So uh, the idea is that uh, for zero interaction, the atoms tunnel to neighboring wave packets in typically uh, uh, one second, according to the parameters we're using. When we add the interaction, uh, when we add the, the atoms form a discrete time crystal, which evolves with a period 40 times the oscillation period of the mirror uh, for long times. Uh, so uh, certain questions are asked with this fairly simple approach. Um, and in particular, there was this, uh, Brief History of Time Crystals, which was uh, written by uh, Vedika Kamani and Roderick Mersler and uh, Sondai. Um, in actual fact, this is, uh, this is a not, not really a brief history. I think it goes for 864 years of time crystals. So it's a, um, not really a br brief history. Uh, so they have a section on effectively few body quantum systems. We note that in, in mapping a many body problem onto a classical few body problem, the properties of the latter uh, may only apparently be inherited in, in the former. However, it's only upon treatment of the problem as a full many body problem, that we settle whether the subharmonic oscillations are a featureless transient, a pre-thermal phenomenon, or a fully robust time crystal in the above sense. Uh, Several mini body examples are in this sense, few body in disguise. So um, we worked with the, the two theorists, Brian Dalton and Jia Wang. Brian was responsible mainly for setting up the basic theory and Jia performing the very complex uh, calculations. So uh, phase space method based on the truncated Wigner approximation. This allows for the quantum fluctuations, uh, fields that regard uh, treated as stochastic rather than deterministic. Uh, it's a full multi-mode treatment and avoids restrictions of the mean field theory where all the bosons are assumed to remain in a single condensate mode. It can treat large atom depletion and also thermalization, which both of which can destroy the time crystal. 
it's asymptotic exact in the large boson particle limit. There's also some related work done with Christoph uh, group in uh, Krakow together with Imperial College group, which they used a uh, time dependent Bugaluba theory, which allows quantum fluctuations, but it assumes small boson depletion from the condensate. So uh, just plotting out position probability densities, this is done for the case of S equals two. Um, and uh, for a harmon harmonic trap initial state, we start off with zero interaction here. Um, and um, looking across, we start at time zero, and this shows, uh, as we come down this first column, this shows um, the wave packet moving towards the mirror and bouncing at the mirror, giving interference fringes, coming back to its original position, and then it rotates at the comes back from the turning point, the classical turning point. Moving on to the next column, this is after 500 uh, mirror oscillations and so on, up, up to 2000 mirror oscillations. Because this is just um, zero interaction, we can just use the gross pedievsky equation, um, in fact, it's really the Schrodinger equation. Um, and this shows, for example, a time about 498, mirror oscillations shows the tunneling where you tunnel from one wave packet to the other. Um, so here you have 50-50. As you go to a longer time, you have 100% tunneling across and then tunneling back 50% until 100% tunneled back after two, about 2,000 mirror oscillations. We can uh, look at this more carefully or analyze it by, you, by calculating the one body projector which is similar to uh, the autocorrelation uh, function in the case of the mean field calculations. And this shows the, um, the beating due to the uh, transfer of population from one wave packet to another. We take a Fourier transform of that and we, uh, the peak is at half, half the frequency of the, uh, of the mirror oscillation and you get a splitting corresponding to J, which is the um, J, which is the, um, the tunneling rate. So we now move on to um, an interaction of minus 0.012. And um, we now find that um, there's a, a big difference here between the gross pedievsky mean field calculations and the uh, TWA phase space calculations. Um, and this corresponds to the regime where we're close to uh, the threshold for producing uh, a stable single, part, a single uh, time crystal. So now um, we have a difference here in the one body projector between the gross Pedievsky between the mean field and the phase space calculations, quite a significant difference. Um, <clears throat> and here is the Fourier transform. We now move on to a large value of the interaction, minus 0.10. And here, um, uh, this, it's indistinguishable between the gross pedievsky mean field calculations and the phase space TWA. Uh, and we can see now that the, the period, um, there's no tunneling anymore once you get to this, this value of the interaction. So you have just a nice clean uh, wave packet. Uh, and this is, um, you can see in the Fourier transform here, where you, uh, you can see, see growing at the frequency of one half the frequency of the, of the drive or twice the period of the drive. Uh, what we're very interested in doing was plotting the, uh, looking at the quantum depletion versus interaction. And this shows the interaction for both an attractive interaction and a repulsive interaction. For the case of uh, a harmonic trap with driving, and it goes, the depletion goes from, this is the maximum depletion uh, up to uh, 2000 uh, mirror oscillations. 
So it goes from virtually uh, depletion virtually zero, but at the in the region where we have where we have the threshold region for producing a time crystal, um, we get this very large increase in the depletion up to about 260 atoms out of 600, uh, which is symmetrical on both sides for both the attractive and the repulsive interaction. Um, if now we don't have any driving, then this shows an uh, enormous difference between uh, the depletion um, and when you have got driving. In addition, we, uh, we tried using uh, a Vania initial condition instead of the harmonic trap from a, harmon a Gaussian from the harmonic trap. Here you have a superposition of Vania states, and here you get uh, the breaking of time translational symmetry uh, at about 0 0.006. So looking at the mode functions for the condensate mode, which is uh, this blue solid line, and the second occupied mode is here, um, all other modes are less than about 1.6%. So uh, a two mode approximation, uh, at least for, for S equals two case, uh, works well. If it was a higher value of S, you need more modes, of course. Uh, an observable of interest is the mean mean energy uh, for different for various interaction strengths, and this shows the time evolution of the mean energy going up to two thousand mirror oscillations. Here we've zoomed in just to show the the oscillation here, um, and for the various interaction strengths that we examined here. Uh, the system reaches a steady state with time, indicating no significant heating by the driving or by the quantum fluctuations out to at least 2000 mirror oscillations. And this is consistent with time crystal behavior. Also in the, uh, the PPDs that I showed before, uh, there's no sign of broadening of the, uh, of the wave packet at very long times out to 2000 mirror oscillations, which is consistent with no significant heating. So just to summarize the uh, TWA multi-mode calculations, this is a full many body treatment for the case of S equals two. The quantum depletion is very small, just less than two atoms in 600 out to at least 200 uh, mirror oscillations, except very close to the threshold interaction for creating a discrete time crystal. Where large depletion, uh, up to almost 50% uh, due to uh, up to about due to quantum fluctuations. Uh, so close to um, so there's excellent agreement with the mean field calculations, except in this region of uh, very close to the threshold. The quantum depletion uh, is due to escape of atoms from the condensate mode to the second occupied mode, with all other modes essentially zero and two mode models should work well in the case of S equals two. The dynamical behavior is largely independent of whether we have both an attractive boson boson interaction or a repulsive boson boson interaction. So it should be possible to create discrete time crystals based on repulsive or attractive interactions. And repulsive interactions, for example, could be very useful if you want to go to a large interaction uh, where in the attractive case, uh, you'd have problems with uh, producing solitons or um, with uh, boson over collapse. The mean energy of the system reaches steady state, indicating no significant heating by the driving or by the quantum fluctuations out to at least 2000 driving cycles. And there's no thermalization out to at least 2000 mirror oscillations. So, based on this, we um, decided to do some calculations on just two mode. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, you have few. Sorry to interrupt. I, you have few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just, how many? Okay. How many? I more? would say three, four. We started three. at fifty-five. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. So with two mode calculations, the depletion is uh, saturates and 
goes out to in the Cape, you have say 5,000 atoms. This is 35,000 drives out here and still no um, uh, additional depletion beyond the saturation value. So uh, regarding experiments, uh, atomic system that we've chosen is potassium 39. Uh, this is, has a very nice feshback resonance, which enables you to tune the interaction very precisely. And the experimental protocol for creating a time crystal is you prepare the uh, potassium 39 BEC in optical dipole trap, about 200 microns above the mirror. This is for S equals 40. Uh, set the trap frequencies to say 95 Hertz. Uh, and match up the, uh, the longitudinal width at the single, uh, matches the single wave packet at the turning point. We can then set the interactions to uh, the value to produce a time crystal uh, and turn off the longitudinal confinement uh, so that you produce uh, an optical waveguide. Many body wave packets launch to bounce on the blue detuned repulsive light sheet mirror and uh, we set the mirror period to be uh, the bounce divided by 40 uh, to create single wave packet locked to this uh, resonant orbit. Position probability is then measured versus evolution time for zero interaction and for an interaction of say minus 0.12 where there's no tunneling. So this is sufficiently strong to break the time translation symmetry to create a stable time crystal. This shows a signature. Uh, Calculated signature, the case S equals 40. Non-interacting case is in blue. Uh, this is as the wave packet uh, versus Z. The, um, and then for the interacting case, this shows the snapshot after the 55th bounce and you have a nice uh, single wave packet oscillating backwards and forwards, which is the discrete time crystal. So how big can you, uh, does the time crystal need to be, or how, how big or how small range can you have? Uh, going from S equals 10 to S equals 100, um, the mirror amplitudes, are, are, for a small S, the mirror amplitudes are large, which is good, um, but the, the drop height is, is too small. Whereas for S equals 100, you have a nice drop height, but the mirror amplitude is small. Um, so somewhere in the middle is, uh, easier to at least to start off with. Um, it turns out that uh, if you now uh, look at having a real a realistic soft Gaussian mirror uh, rather than a hard wall mirror, uh, you have to drive the mirror harder to have the same effect as a, uh, as a hard wall mirror. And for the case S equals 30, uh, something like 75 nanometers uh, changes from say six nanometers to something by an order of magnitude up to about 75 nanometers, according to our simulations. So in summary, uh, BC of ultra cold atoms bouncing resonantly on an oscillating mirror can reveal dramatic breaking of discrete time translation symmetry to give big discrete time crystals evolving with a period, with periods in the range say 20 to 100 mirror, uh, the, the, the period of the mirror. Uh, for many body uh, uh, PWA treatment for S equals two is an excellent agreement with the mean field calculations, except at interaction strengths very close to the threshold for creating a stable time crystal. The quantum depletion is small, uh, negligible, uh, except close to the threshold, at least out to uh, 2000 mirror oscillations, no significant heating by the periodic driving or quantum fluctuations no thermalization uh, out to 2000 driving cycles. So big time crystals provide a flexible flat platform um, because a large number of lattice sites in the time domain for studying a broad range of condensed matter phenomena in the time domain, opening up uh, a new field of research. Thank you for your attention. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the nice talk. Uh, so I think we have time for Questions, please, if you have, uh, if you would like to ask, yes or that, yes. So I asked to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I managed. So uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the the fact that the realization is done with 
many, many atoms. And now you establish under the time-dependent drive that a two-mode description would, would be sufficient in order to kind of see uh, similar phenomena to what you have. So in light of the fact that you also showed the front page or the citation from the review, uh, would you say that you have a many body system that in the end is effectively described by a few uh, degrees of freedom physics or is it many body inherently? I think the important thing is the calculation was done for a genuine many body system with a large number of modes. All we're saying is, is that uh, it can be approximated by a two mode system uh, at least for s equals two, um, and this enables us to do uh, calculations which we couldn't do using uh, the many multi-mode system. Uh, but the the calculation itself is a is a genuine multi-mode many-body calculation. So I think it does uh, answer this question, which. Uh, uh, we we're asking ourselves too, of course, um, how important the quantum fluctuations is it going to destroy the time crystal? But I guess it, you, you've seen that quantum fluctuations in the end plays a small role and technically the many body dynamics or the fact that you have many body, they form many body normal modes, but then after, under the drive, it's, it's the physics of time translation symmetry breaking of a few modes of many bodies notion, right? I mean, there are many particles that participate in this macroscopic normal modes, but um, the time translation symmetry breaking can be captured by an effective few mode description, right? Yes. yes. In that case, yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think the I'm calculation... Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, you know. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, since I don't have the <clears throat> question, so I have a question myself. May you, may you give, uh, so I did not get why having uh, either repulsive of, uh, or attractive interaction does not play any role. Is there a simple way to understand this? I, I did not get it. Yes, uh, it's a good question. Um, The, the calculations don't show any difference, any significant difference, is all we're saying at this stage. Um, I, think, I think it's very useful if uh, we can use repulsive interaction um, from the point of view of being able to use larger interactions without uh, implosion and uh, without producing solitons, for example. Um, but this probably needs to be looked at in a bit more detail. Okay. We, yes, so most of the calculations were done with attractive interactions. There was just a, a few done with repulsive. Okay. So, Ling Zheng, Google, you have to unmute. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how, go ahead. How, how large is your transversal trapping potential? So, you are using a Corsi 1D or SIGA. Sigma uh, shaped uh, uh, trapping potential, right? So, how large is your transversal trapping potential? It's a bit distorted. I'm sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't. Okay. Hear it. Yeah. So I said uh, slowly. Uh, so, how large is your uh, transversal trapping potential? So you you are using a uh, quasi one D harmonic uh, trapping potential, right? Yes. Yeah. So, how large is the uh, the transversal trapping potential? Uh, well, it's an optical dipole trap with uh, trapping frequencies of ninety-five yeah. hertz. Um, so, it's a normal sort of optical dipole trap. Yeah, so I, what you call large, what you call small. 
Okay, so because I saw one slide from you, uh, uh, there is um, the actual, it seems the actual trapping frequency is equal to the transversal trapping frequency. It's about uh, 90, 95 hertz, something yep. like that. Yep. So, yeah, I'm wondering if it's not a, a quasi 1D uh, harmonic potential. It's uh, okay. There okay, is flexibility. So, there is oh. flexibility here, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just one set of parameters. Oh, okay. Two more questions, Oded, and then Christoph. Sorry, and then we go ahead. Oded, I am with you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sal. So I, I actually wanted to just comment on the positive view and negative view uh, uh, discussion that you started, Sal, and. Uh, if you look at the effective normal mode, so if you have many body interactions in your in your cloud and they form a many body normal mode that then afterwards has residual attractive or repulsive interactions, then uh, the the you know the macroscopic parametric oscillator as it goes into instability will be uh, stabilized either by the positive or negative nonlinearities. So so. This is just a, mm -hmm. a, a five to the four type uh, response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just as Thank a you. comment. Uh, Christoph? Yes, yeah. thank you. Actually, I, I wanted to comment on the same uh, topic because if you consider repulsive or attractive interactions, then within, for example, two mode approximation, then you either you deal with the, with the time crystal which corresponds to the lowest energy state at this manifold or to the highest energy state of this manifold. And it turns out that both of them are stable in time. So that is... Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> the nice talk. I think we can proceed. Uh, so there is a... There will be a, lo a lot of virtual clapping hands. So this is your... The first one for you, and uh, <clears throat> I think we can move to the next talk by Angelo Russo Man. It's about many body synchronization in classical Hamiltonian systems. <clears throat> um, I uh, stop the sharing. Yeah, uh, Angelo, you may. Angela, are you there? Uh, I have to unmute you. <clears throat> Angelo, you have to, I mean, I ask to unmute and then you have to press something. I think it's okay now. You have to share the screen now. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes, you have to share the screen. Mm, can you see? I have shared it. Can you see it? Now, yeah, now yes. Go ahead. Yeah, you can. Start. Yeah, yeah, we hear you. So you can start. Okay. Okay. Half. Uh, I have twenty-five minutes, right? Yes. Okay. I hope you are uh, hearing me. Yes. And today I will talk about our last research about the many-body synchronization in a classical Hamiltonian system. Because these results are strongly based on uh, time crystal in spin systems, and because we are start uh, beginning our conference now, I will do uh, a long uh, part of my talk. I will devote a long part of my talk to the time crystal in Floquet uh, spin systems. 
which will be, I think, relevant also for the rest of the conference, because these things will come over and over again. These are the two uh, papers where uh, you can find uh, uh, the things I'm telling you today. And these are my collaborators, Fernando Iemini, Marcello Dalmonte, Rosario Fazio, Rehane Kasek, and Stefano Ruffo. So, uh, time crystal, is time translation symmetry break impossible? Uh, pr probably yes, instead we should not be, we would not be here talking about it. And there are uh, many ways in which this can happen, and we focus on um, uh, a precise way, the spatiotemporal ordering, which means uh, the following. When you have a, a second order phase transition and you have a phase with longer range order, uh, you have that uh, you have a local observable O and you evaluate the correlator and if you do uh, the, the and you do the thermodynamic limit and in this case if you do the limit of infinite distance you get the thing which is different from zero and does not depend on time. Uh, uh, in order to uh, break time translation symmetry, uh, you do a generalization of this fact and you request that this quantity is not simply different from zero, but depends on time in a periodic way. I show this in this picture here. And uh, uh, still in analogy with the second order phase transitions, you can characterize this uh, spatial temporal ordering, also uh, considering uh, a macroscopic order parameter which should be time periodic in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, you evaluate the expectation. You do the uh, uh, infinite size limit and you get a thing which depends periodically in time. So uh, this is a definition. I, uh, is it possible to find such a phenomenon in nature? Uh, in 2015, Watanabe and Oshikawa discovered that this is impossible in ground or thermal state of static systems with local interaction. This is a no-go theorem. Uh, with uh, infinite range interaction, this is possible, as uh, one of the talks today will show. Uh, but uh, another possibility is um, saying, OK, I don't want thermal equilibrium. I don't want ground state. I go in a non-equilibrium context. And here, you can find the translation symmetry breaking. And one context where this happens is uh, periodically driven systems. Uh, you have uh, here a Hamiltonian, which is uh, not symmetric under continuous translation symmetry, but under uh, discrete translation symmetry. This Hamiltonian is periodic of period tau. And in order to have uh, a translation symmetry breaking, you request that there is uh, an observable, a microscopic observable, whose expectation in the thermodynamic limit is periodic, but with a period multiple of the driving period. So you break uh, the discrete translation symmetry to another discrete translation symmetry uh, with a longer uh, period. And uh, a context where this typically happens is uh, a spin system where uh, you apply a pulsed feed, pulsed uh, magnetic feed, and uh, each time you apply a pulse, you have that the magnetization response changes its sign. So your pulsing is of period tau but your magnetization comes back to the initial value after a period two tau. So you have a period doubling. It's a particular case of a period entupling. There are cases where there is n larger than two. And uh, there are some properties that this time grisa should have. Uh, first of all, you have that this period doubling oscillation should be persistent in the thermodynamic limit because you want something like uh, a second order phase transition. A um, phenomenon of global ordering occurring all in the thermodynamic limit. And second, uh, because in, in nature, in the quantum world, there are many forms of oscillations, uh, you need that this is not just uh, an isolated point with some special oscillation and you change a little bit your parameters and they disappear. You need to have really a phase. So uh, this period doubling should be rigid to parameter change in order to be a collective phenomenon uh, due to interactions. And uh, it's clear that this phenomenon is strictly related to synchronization because you need that your, uh, um, for instance, in these uh, spin systems, your site oscillate coherently with each other in order to have a macroscopic quantity oscillating with the period double of the driving period. 
Let's move now to do a simple example before to going to more complex things. And this example was proposed by Nayak and other people in 2016. You see, you have a easing system with a static part in which you have the ZZ interaction. This JI is disordered. Later I will tell you why it's so important that it is disordered. And here you have a, a kicking. This kicking, uh, you see, is pi halves times sigma x. And its effect is uh, flipping all the spins um, from up to down. And if you do the evolution, you have this is the time evolution operator over one period, and you have that the, the, the static part, if you start with the state all pointing up, uh, does not do anything, it just applies a phase. And the spin flip kicking, you be it just flips all the spins. And so if you look at this macroscopic order parameter, the magnetization along Z, you see that uh, you start with the state uh, all pointing along Z. You apply UA, it stays pointing along Z. You apply UB, it flips. You apply still UA, it is pointing along Z, but in the negative direction. You still apply UB, you flip. And so you have a period, I applied twice your time evolution operator. So uh, two periods of your driving have passed but uh, the magnetization comes back to the initial value after a period of two tone, and you have got your period doubling. This is a special point with this pi halves. The point is that if this thing is stable, if I change pi halves to another value, pi halves, and uh, uh, from a numerical point of view, you can see that it's so. You see, this is the more general model in which you add other terms in your static part, and uh, your uh, phi is different from pi. And numerically, Nayak and others find that uh, there is still the time crystal. Uh, here you can see basically the magnetization along Z with a minus one to the n in front in order to uh, have a constant sign and don't see uh, the changes at every, of sign at every period in order to better visualize if there is the time crystal or not. And you can see uh, that this quantity is different from zero up to a time, and this time increases exponentially with the system size, this decay time uh, Tb. So you still have uh, your time crystal. And in order that uh, your time crystal being stable to changes of parameter, uh, it's essential the fact that there is here disorder, because the disorder uh, has a double effect. First of all, due to disorder, there are no degeneracies in the Floch spectrum. The Floch spectrum is a generalization of the Hamiltonian spectrum to um, periodic system, a very simple generalization. And if you have no degeneracies, you change phi, and uh, with the perturbation theory, you see that the structure of your uh, eigenstates of the dynamics are not changed. Um, instead, if you have no disorder, there are degeneracies, uh, you apply phi, and due to the degeneracies, you strongly change the structure of your eigenstates, and you lose uh, the long-range quantum correlations, which are behind the time increase. So this is a very important point, but I have no time to go deep in it. Later, if you are curious, I will go deeper in it. Another effect of this order is inducing many-body localization. Many-body localization uh, is a peculiar quantum effect occurring in disordered systems uh, that, uh, due to this order, uh, magically many localized integrals of motion appear, impose strong constraints on the dynamics, and you break ergodicity. Your system does not yet have to heat up to infinite temperature, and you can have complex dynamics like a time crystal. And the uh, effect of many body localization, as I've told, just told you, is inducing localized integrals of motion. These are the L bit operators. And they impose a strong constraint on the properties of the eigenstates, both of the uh, static dynamics and both of the periodic dynamics. Considering just the static dynamics, uh, you see that the eigenstates have this form of tensor product of objects which are polarized, plus, minus, plus. This is called the glassy order uh, the Hamiltonian. And this is very important for getting the time crystal. Because uh, uh, you can, uh, you see that uh, your glassy uh, eigenstates appear in pairs, one with plus and one with minus. Actually, for any finite size, the true eigenstates uh, are the superposition of the two, if these hi are equal to zero. But let's imagine that they are different from zero, so these are the uh, true eigenstates. And uh, um, if you uh, apply period kicking dynamics, uh, you see that your dynamics uh, um, moves at each step of the uh, kicking from the uh, manifold with negative magnetization to the manifold with the positive magnetization. And uh, um, this moving from the two between the two manifolds is behind the existence of the time crystal. 
And the um, 10 crystal for any finite size lasts a finite time because you can show with some calculations that uh, you come back not exactly, but uh, with a correction exponentially small in the system size. But if you go to the thermodynamic limit, this correction disappears and you have your uh, period doubling lasting infinite time. But the first thing we have done uh, in, uh, in our research was trying to generalize this effect to different forms of Hamiltonian. And the first thing we did, it was replacing uh, this order with long range interactions. And this is the model we use. This is basically the model by Nayak, but the disordered short range interactions were replaced by infinite range clean interactions. Uh, this gives uh, an effect similar to disorder, both in the point of the generalis and in the point of ergodicity breaking. Because here you can uh, rewrite your Hamiltonian in terms of this collective spin variables. And so you have basically dynamics of a big spin. And um, the value of this S square, the, uh, the magnitude of this big spin is conserved. And uh, uh, this imposes a strong constraint on the dynamics. And another constraint is induced by the full permutation symmetry of this model. Uh, basically, if you exchange any two pairs of sites, the model does not change. So you have many strong constraints on dynamics. These strong constraints uh, are such that ergodicity is broken. And from what the other side, uh, this constraint is such that the model is numerically feasible because you restrict to a subspace with uh, a certain value of the spin, for instance, n half, the subspace where there is the ground state of the model. And so you can do numerics. Moreover, because you are restricted to the subspace and this subspace does not talk with other subspaces, you have solved the problem of the genesis, and you can get your time crystal. And now I show to you how. Let's start from the model without the driving. This model uh, is symmetric um, under the Z2 symmetry, uh, but if H is small, it uh, breaks it, because uh, you can uh, do this plot of uh, energy versus the expectation of SZ on your eigenstates. And you see when your eigenstates are below a broken symmetry edge, a value of the energy density, they appear in uh, pairs. Uh, they appear in pairs. And uh, um, whenever you have uh, a finite system size, uh, you have uh, that the eigenstates are the even and odd superposition of these pairs. And so uh, you don't break any symmetry. Your magnetization expectation of the magnetization is zero. But when you go to the thermodynamic limit, they become degenerate and you can break the Z2 symmetry. And you have an eigenstate uh, with positive magnetization and an eigenstate with negative magnetization. And this breaking of the Z2 symmetry in the thermodynamic limit is strictly related to the possibility of breaking the time translation symmetry in the thermodynamic limit. Because when you apply your kicking, you have that at each kick, you move from uh, the sub-manifold with the negative magnetization to the sub-manifold with the positive magnetization, and so on and so forth. And in this way, you have the period doubling. This is strictly analogous to the thing I showed you, to you before in the disordered case, uh, when you move from the two uh, glassy ordered uh, sub-manifold with the different signs of the magnetization. Here, it is exactly the same. And you can see it. Uh, you can do the simulation of your dynamics and study the evolution of your magnetization along Z and see that you have this persistent period doubling. And uh, if you do the Fourier transform, uh, you see uh, that uh, um, you have a peak at the period doubling frequency at the one corresponding to double of the period when n is large. When n is small, we have two side peaks, but the gap between these two peaks decreases exponentially fast in the system side. So in the thermodynamic limit, you have just one peak marking period doubling. And uh, here I show to you uh, some plots in, in which uh, um, I show the maximum of the Fourier transform versus phi in order to show to you that this time crystal is a phase and not just an isolated point. And in the plot below, you see uh, the difference uh, from uh, the frequency of the peak uh, in the Fourier transform and the period doubling frequency, and this is essentially zero in this region where uh, the peak is different from zero. So you have a phase where there is this time crystal. And you can interpret uh, it in the thermodynamic limit with a classical model. 
because uh, you can see that when you go uh, to the thermodynamic limit, this quantity, uh, which is the limit of uh, the thermodynamic limit of the expectation of the component of the mechanization divided by n, this quantity m alpha, behaves as a classical variable and obeys a classical Hamiltonian. And uh, you can uh, really visualize what happens doing a canonical transformation between uh, these uh, three variables, and mix M, Y, M, Z, to uh, two canonical variables, Q, P, and uh, plotting uh, your Poinc stroboscopic Poincaré section. It means that uh, you do your dynamics, and after each period, uh, you plot a point in this uh, phase space. And let's start to see what happens for phi equal to pi. Uh, you see, you have uh, uh, these two regions, uh, which um, are symmetric, one with respect to the other uh, along the Z2 symmetry. And if you start uh, from this uh, one of these two isolated points, these two um, invariant points of the dynamics, in some sense, and you apply your kicking, you move from one, is uh, this is an isolated point of the static, uh, the undriven dynamics, and you apply your kicking, you move from one of these points to the other, so on and so forth, and you have the period doubling. This is for phi equal to pi. When you slightly change phi from pi, you slightly change the structure of your uh, phase space, and uh, nevertheless, you have these two regions of phase space, uh, uh, which are connected to each other by the kicking. So you start in one of these trajectories and the kicking moves back and forth to the symmetric trajectory. And so you still see uh, the period doubling because between one kicking and the other, the system is trapped in one of these two regions. When uh, phi is large enough, instead uh, you have uh, uh, that you are in a trajectory symmetric under the Z2 symmetry and you have no more data in crystal. Uh, this uh, classical model is at the root of the possibility of constructing the Hamiltonian uh, um, synchronization I write in the title of my talk. Because let's consider this classical model, but not just one of them, many of them, coupled by a long range interacting kicking. And let's start from a case with, uh, when, when uh, uh, in case of no interactions, uh, your model shows the time crystal. One of the cases I have showed it to you before. Uh, and now let's switch on the interaction. If you switch on the interaction, you see that there are period doubling oscillations which decay after a time. But when alpha, this uh, exponent of the long range interaction, is below some threshold, you see that the decay time of these interactions increases with the system size, increases as a power law. And so this tells you that you have a time crystal, uh, because in the thermodynamic limit, this decay time lasts an infinite time. And uh, you can actually do a phase diagram where you have the time crystal and we have not the time crystal. And remarkably, uh, you can have a time crystal uh, when the region of a space you explore is perfectly regular, but also when the region of space, space you explore with your dynamics is uh, a, a little bit chaotic. You, there are probes of classical chaos you can use and see that it's a little bit chaotic. When chaos is beyond some threshold, Angelo. you get back to thermalization. Angelo, you have five minutes, okay? Saro. Five more minutes. Okay, but uh, I'm almost finished. I have, uh, okay. I have a last slide to show to you. Because it is a classical phenomenon, uh, one question is if this uh, phenomenon is stable to quantum fluctuations, and you can quantize it. And instead of putting those classical spin variables, mj, alpha, you put some quantum spin, s, j, z, of size l. And uh, to make a long story short, you have uh, that uh, this model is infinite range interacting, so the important variables are the collective spins. And you can do a bosonic representation, and so they write this Hamiltonian as a bosonic Hamiltonian. And if you go the uh, limit, the thermodynamic limit, and going to infinite, you can describe it by means of some gross Pidayevsky equations, which are uh, easy to solve numerically. And what you say if you plot uh, minus n uh, to the t over tau times mz of t, this is a quantity which is always one if you have a period doubling. Uh, you see that there are these Rabi oscillations. So you lose essentially your time crystal uh, because instead of having a period doubling, your period doubling is modulated by these Rabi oscillations. But what you see 
Uh, if you do the Fourier transform and you study the frequency of these radio oscillations versus L, the size of the spins, is that uh, that frequency goes to zero as L goes to infinity. So when L goes to infinity, which is the classical limit, limit when uh, these uh, quantum spins uh, are uh, come back to be classical, uh, your uh, uh, Rabi frequency goes to zero and you recover the time crystal. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, thank you for your attention, and please ask me if there are questions. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Angelo. So, also thanks for being in time. There is a question, Jamir. You are welcome. But, you know. Hi, Angelo. Thank you so much. Very cute talk. So, can you go back to the phase diagram? Hi, Jamir. Hi, Angelo. How are you doing? You're interested, right? I think we Sorry, should. Jamir, go. I try to switch know, off know, my camera. Right. So Sorry, maybe great. this. Uh, <laughs> Can you go back to the, no, this the camera slide? Is slide 13. Can you hear me? Angelo. Jamir, sorry, can you repeat? I will not hear you. Yes, can you go back to slide 13? Tell me when uh, I should stop. Okay. Oh, now 13, one free, slide 13. One free. You're going in the opposite direction, Angelo. 13. One free, 13. Uh, but I, I have no, okay, not the, the numbers the of the slides the here. So please tell me which is the topic of yeah, yes, the slide. Yes, the one with the phase diagram, synchronization, thermalization, time crystal, it's at the end. Eh, ho capito, però che cosa c'è in questa slide? Che non ce ne ho i numeri qua. Phase no? diagram, there is the phase diagram. diagram. Ah, phase diagram. Questa qua? No, it's at the end, it's towards the end. You, you were showing when there was this long range with up here, yeah, this one. This hey, one. Uh, right. this, in so, this one, there is the phase uh, diagram. Yes. So what about order parameters? So is this transition from... The phase diagram of the classical model, correct? So, mm -hmm. so is the transition from synchronization to thermalization a crossover, or do you have some order parameter that is doing first or second order transition, something like that? I'm interested in that part. Hello, my, I think the connection is not working properly. But can you hear me? I, I can hear you. I think it's... I'm, Sarah, uh, can you hear me? Uh, well, uh, we... Uh, no. Maybe somebody else should try to ask a question. To I, I can hear you, but not Jamir. Okay, so I, I asked Jamir's question. The Jamir's question hmm. is... Can you, can you, you like collect to... Jamir's question? And yes, uh, just li listen to me. So uh, uh, the question is that you would like to know about order parameter. What is the order parameter which characterizes the transition? Uh, I'm afraid uh, the connection does not work. He can speak, so, but he can't hear. Essentially. Yeah, so, so I, I would So uh, that... if I would like to know about order parameter, what should I do? What is the order parameter? So I, I think it does not work. So I would say we just move to the to the next speaker. Okay. Aspetta, Saro, ti chiamo per telefono. No, no, it says uh, we go to, to the next speaker, and the next speaker is uh, Peter van der Straten. Peter, may you share the screen, please? And I will unmute you. Sorry, I'm calling you by phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you speak? Can you hear me? A bit lower. Can you speak? 
Okay, can you hear me? Now it's okay. So please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. This uh, talk is about spontaneous symmetry breaking in a discrete space-time crystal. And the paper is a collaboration between the groups, uh, the experimental theoretical groups in Utrecht. So um, Jasper Smits is uh, the PhD student who did all the measurements. And the theoretical group is led by uh, Hank Stove. And we, I would like to discuss the symmetry breaking, but first I want to introduce our system because our system is quite different from all other systems. Uh, and we're looking at a, a superfluid system. So let's um, do the introduction of that system first. So I'm not going to say a lot about time crystals, but when the first time we stumbled upon them, then we made this slide uh, some time ago back in the conference in Krakow. And I claimed that uh, this uh, time crystals is a very nice merger of non-equilibrium physics with uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So it's in between there because on the one hand, there's the, the the time evolution, the flocase system, the free thermal phases, and on the other end, we have crystals and phase transitions. And so this is uh, somewhere in between where we are, uh, which made it very interesting. And at that time, I did not expect that we could actually measure all these uh, phenomena uh, in our system. And uh, I want to show you the results of these experiments in this talk. So we're motivated by experiments. So what I want to show you first is uh, how we observe a time crystal in our experiment. This is work which was already presented in Krakow, uh, but I will go back to it again to show that we really have a space-time crystal. Then I will go into our latest investigations into these time crystals because we can actually measure a lot of the properties of these uh, time crystals. And then in the last part of my talk, I will go to the spontaneous symmetry break. So we're going to observe uh, a space-time crystal and uh, it's a discrete time crystal in a superfluid droplet. And how we can achieve that, I will show you in, in a minute. So uh, we are performing an experiment and this is a schematic diagram of our experiment. So what we observe uh, here is uh, we start with a, a superfluid droplet, we cool, trap it, put it to rest, uh, and then uh, going to investigate our time crystal by first making an excitation. So what we are doing, it is in the trap, so we can modulate our trap frequency by two pulses, and then we make an excitation of the radial mode. So the radial mode starts to breathe, and it's uh, going thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, so it's oscillating in time. And this mode is going to drive my time crystal. So this is the drive we're going to use in the experiment. Well, what is the, the, the time crystal? Well, in the time crystal, in our case, is a high order actual mode. And so as you can see, the, uh, the drive couples to this actual mode by the nonlinear interaction. And then you see a spatial profile, a high order uh, spatial profile, which goes on and off, on and off. And this is what we're going to investigate in our experiment. So these were the first results, which were published uh, two and a half years ago. So what we do is we observe uh, our superfluid droplet uh, sometime after our excitation. So this is half a second after our excitation. And what we see is a very nice high order actual profile. And at the same time, we see that the radial width of this cloud is uh, shrinking, getting wider, shrinking, getting wider. So it's oscillating. And this profile, which we observe, the high order actual profile is also disappearing, reappearing, disappearing, reappearing. And we can follow this system for a, a couple of hundred milliseconds and then, and then observe the, uh, the crystal. Now it's very hard to, to look at all these images. So what we do is we actually we integrating out the radial direction. So we take the total density in the uh, in the actual direction as a parameter, and then we plot it for all our spectra, so that's more than uh, 50 images. 
And then what we observe is uh, something like this. So you see that uh, the condensate is about uh, of the order of uh, a millimeter. And then we observe in time about 15 oscillation periods of the drive. We saw that uh, we see that uh, the pattern is there. It disappears, it reappears, it disappears, it reappears, and this continues on for about 10 cycles of the drive. If we look a little bit closer and we zoom into the center part, you clearly see this, uh, this space-time pattern. At the same time, this is uh, the same uh, part of the spectrum, but then measured just after the kick, and you see nothing at all. So it's clear that this pattern is induced uh, by the drive. In order to prove that it's really a space-time crystal, what we do is we use this, uh, this pattern and we make a Fourier transform, just like you would do if you would do Bragg scattering. And so what you see up here is that uh, just after the excitation, there's only one peak in the center, which is the main peak. But then if we continue uh, at a later time, then you really see uh, a nice uh, four peaks here. And the most important thing to notice is that this peak appears at half the frequency, half the drive frequency. So you see the period doubling clearly by these peaks. There are a little bit small artifacts over here, and there's uh, a little bit uh, a K, K equals zero peak uh, for the drive frequency, but uh, these peaks are well getting out of the background. So it's clear that we have observed this space time crystal. What can we expect a space time crystal in the experiment? Well. At the same time, what we can do is we can do a simulation of our system. A droplet, we uh, are governed by the gross pietievsky equation, so we can just integrate this in time, apply the same procedure for modulating the trap frequencies. And then you see a, a nice pattern appearing after about half a second. And you see that there are these three, four peaks, and of course, the artifacts which appear in the experiment disappeared. Okay, so this was our experiment some time ago, two and a half years ago, and now we continued our investigations. Uh, and what we really want to do is also to describe, together with the theoreticians, uh, an up initial description of our space time crystal. And before I will go into the results, I first uh, want to show a technical slide for the experimentalist in the audience because it's uh, important what we achieved is dominated by the fact that we got a new uh, imaging system of our uh, atoms, which will, I will explain shortly. So normally what you do if you have an imaging system, you have some kind of probe. The probe is, uh, is, is shine on a cloud of atoms and then it's imaged on the camera. And in our case, the first experiments were done with phase contrast imaging. So what we do is we put a phase spot in here and then we see an interference pattern on the camera. We can deduce the accumulated phase of the atoms. And from that, we can see our uh, density pattern of the condensate. Now, in our new technique, we're not uh, using uh, the, the space spot anymore, but we're using a separate reference beam. And this separate reference beam is also uh, projected on the camera, overlapped with the probe beam, but then at a, at a very small angle. And then if we look at this interference pattern on the um, camera, then we see nice fringes here because the two are under a small angle. So of course we expect fringes, but these fringes are modulated somehow in the center. Now what we do is where we take a Fourier transform and then we see in the center, of course, uh, the two beams, but the interference pattern is now moved to the side due to the fact that we have them under a small angle. That's why it's called off-axis holography. And then we see this pattern here, which is an interference pattern between the main beam, the reference beam, and the probe beam. And since uh, the, the, the reference beam is uh, totally flat, we can subtract or divide out the reference beam. And then what we, we're left with is with the probe beam, the electric field of the probe beam. And so what we see here is the dispersion of the beam, which is due to the fact that it passed through our cloud. And at the same time, we see absorption of the beam, which is very small due to the fact that we detuned very far because we want to keep the absorption as small as possible. And at the same time, we see a very nice dispersion signal, which gives us full control over the, our imaging. 
And the very nice thing about this is that the, that the, the, fraction, the, the scattering losses are very, very small. So instead of taking 50 images, we can take more than 200 images. And at the same time, we can really make the excitations in our system much, much smaller uh, since we, uh, our uh, resolution has improved. So we did some new measurements looking at the uh, space-time crystal. Now, this is not a simulation. This is really experiments. So instead of taking only 50 uh, images, we take more than 200. We take about 250 images, stack, stack them together, and you see this space-time crystal, which is stable in time over a very long period of time, many, many drives, hundreds of drives, and you see that it's stable all the time. And again, we can make a Fourier transform and this is not on a linear scale like the previous one, but this is really on a logarithmic scale. And you see the main peak, and here you see the four peaks of the space-time crystal. And here again, this is at half the frequency. So we have the period, period doubling, which is uh, reminiscent of the space-time crystal. So we worked together with the, the group of stove to, uh, to get uh, an up initial model. And in this system, with this superfluid system, uh, we can easily write down the Lagrangian density, which depends on the density on the phase of our superfluid. We do this in the external potential, so we have to take the potential into account. This is the nonlinear interaction due to, the, uh, to the, uh, the mean field. And then this is a uh, Now we're in the linear regime, which means that we can simply add the, uh, the density of our, uh, of our superfluid, which is in a briefing mode. So we, the briefing is, in, is uh, included in this density up here. And then we have all the modes, summed over not k, but summed over i, all the modes, all high order actual modes, which we have to sum over. And at the same time, we also have to add these two phases. Um, but since we uh, can be very specific and make the excitation weak, we can select one mode, one mode J, in which we excite. And for this mode J, we can find the density in terms of uh, function. Uh, the function is uh, the difference between two Legendre polynomials. And in order to take this function, we can make sure, first of all, that it satisfies the uh, Kosovo-Pikievsky equation, and at the same time, um, the density goes down when we go to the side, uh, to, to, the, to the edges of the condensate, which is actually what we observe in the experiment as well. So it satisfied the boundary conditions, and at the same time, we have to uh, adjust the, the phase of this uh, high order mode in, in this way to be self consistent. And so we can scale all this uh, with z tilde, where z tilde is just the distance in the z direction divided by the radial, by the Thomas Fermi radius in the exponential. And so this is a uh, very nice, uh, well, does it match with uh, the experiment? Well, here's um, a mode profile. This is the experiment on the top. Here you see uh, the uh, calculation where we took this density into account. So the sum of the condensate and the high order extra mode, one mode, J, and as you can see, uh, they match uh, perfectly. And at the same time, if we take, if we make a cross along the center of our condensate, you see all the nice oscillations due to this high order actual mode. So uh, I think uh, uh, ansatz is a, a really good one. Of course, what we would like to do is uh, not uh, use this Hamiltonian, but uh, quantize the Hamiltonian. And we can easily do so by uh, this kappa parameter, which we have. Uh, express it in terms of the annihilation operator with some conversion factor Q, and Q depends on all properties we know of the condensate, on the two body interaction, on the frequency. What we can actually do is we can make this quantized Hamiltonian in a, in a rotating frame, rotating with the drive, and then make a rotating wave approximation. And then what you see is uh, three, uh, four terms, and all these terms are independent of time. And that means that our, that our time crystal is actually uh, not a many body localization time crystal, but it's in a, in a pre thermal phase. Um, there's a detuning here, which is the detuning from half the drive frequency minus the, the resonance frequency of this mode. There's a drive parameter here, which we can adjust by, let's say, breathe harder or less hard. 
And there's a, a fourth order term which we included here, which uh, takes all higher order um, couplings into account, which we left out in the model, which accounts for, uh, for all these terms. And then if we make a classical approximation telling us that the, the expectation value of the emulation operator is much, much larger than one, then we get two differential equations for a complex conjugate only depending on delta G and the drive. And this is uh, something of course uh, we can easily solve. So to see that this really works, uh, we looked at the, 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 our space time crystal as a function of time. First, when we apply to a large kick, then you can see there's many oscillations, but uh, we can really uh, match uh, the, the, the data very well. And if we apply a small kick, then we have to wait for a longer, more than half a second before we actually, uh, the, the space time crystal kicks in. But as you can see, it, uh, the uh, simulation really matches the, uh, the experiment uh, quite nicely. So we know for sure that we have the right model. Now the nice thing about this model actually is, is that uh, we can write this uh, in, a, as a, in a way in an effective potential. So not the differential equation for A or the complex of A, but the absolute value of A. And so we can write this as a, a second order derivative of uh, absolute value of A as the, the, the derivative of the A, uh, the derivative with respect of A of some potential which depends on the absolute value of A. And if you do the math right, then you will find this uh, potential, uh, again, in, uh, as a function of uh, the parameters, uh, kick, the, the tuning, and the G parameter. Now, of course, this is a formula, so let's uh, plot this formula. And first of all, let me plot it for uh, G equals zero. Then we get this phase diagram. And actually at zero, zero, where the drive is zero, and the tuning is zero, we have some tri-critical point. And then when we move out, then we have this gray area where we can actually have the space-time crystal. And we have the white area where there is no space-time crystal. And it's clear why there is no space-time crystal because as you can see, the minute there is the potential, the minimum for the potential is for absolute value of A is zero, so no space-time crystal. But then if we increase our uh, parameter, then you can see that the minimum shifts to a finite value. So here we have a space-time crystal. And since the real part of G equals zero, it's symmetrical with respect to the detuning. So the same situation applies for positive detuning. The situation gets even more complicated when the real part of G becomes larger than zero, sorry, larger than zero. And then what you can see is uh, still for a negative detuning, we have the same situation. So there's a first order transition from, uh, sorry, a second order transition from here to there. And it's a smooth transition, but for a positive detuning, the situation actually gets much more interesting because here we have a minimum, but uh, for smaller values A, we have a maximum. And so if we move our space time crystal created here and we moved it to a smaller drive, then you can actually, we can perhaps make it metastable state here, which perhaps tunnels to A equals zero, I don't know, but this might be very interesting to explore. Now this potential helps us to find the minimum. Of course, we want to find the minimum and, and test this formula. So the minimum, the equilibrium for A is given by this expression, again, in the same three parameters. And so what we uh, can do, we can actually do the experiment like we did and then change the drive. So increase the drive and then we can see that there is an increase in the number of quanta in our system. And uh, this uh, are the data points and the, the curve matches uh, pretty well for some detuning and some G parameter. And so we observe a perfect agreement. So uh, we have trust in, in the model. Okay. I will come to, to the last part now, uh, part now the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And before I will introduce that, I will first discuss a, a domino stone. So let's uh, think about the domino stone, which is standing upright. And let's make it a classical domino, so, and let's make it infinitely thin. And then, of course, the domino will fall on its side. And it can, uh, it can move to the right, or it can move to the left. 
Um, and so this, uh, this symmetry, which is here, the left-right symmetry is, is broken. And of course, this is a small perturbation which classically acts on this uh, domino. So it's not really interesting. But then the question is, what happens if we have a quantum domino? Now? And of course, in the, in the quantum systems, we have fluctuations. And so the question is then, well, what happens if the domino falls on its side? Will it fall in a linear superposition to the left and the right at the same time? And then will it continue to fall? until it's, uh, it's either left or right. Well, it's still in a linear superposition. Well, at the moment, we will try to detect where the domino is, left or right. And then it will choose one of the two sides, and then we can do then the symmetry is broken. So why are we interested in this spontaneous symmetry breaking? Because we were looking at our data. And since our data has such high quality right now, we actually observed that this, uh, this drive and this, uh, this space-time crystal, they are actually phase-locked, like it's a driven dissipative system. So what you see here, here's the width of our uh, condensate. This is the briefing mode. And you see there's a zero crossing here, and it matches perfectly well all these zero crossings with the maximum of our space-time crystal. So somehow this phase is locked, and this is what you expect because uh, the damping is a, a rather small so you expect a very good locking of the two, and we can actually observe that quite easily. But then when we continue to do the experiment, then we found out that if we prepare our system identically and also make the kick in an identical way, like you see in here, and we displaced one of them to make a clear that they're actually quite well synchronized, these two kicks, so the two experiments really have the same kick, then at some point, we saw the space-time crystal with a slope up, and at the other time we saw the space-time crystal with a slope down. So, in fact, there is a, it seems like here uh, the phase lag is zero, and here the phase lag is close to pi. So it seems that the phase delay is not really determined rather well in our experiment, and that there are two options. And of course, when we talk to the theoreticians, of course, they said, well, Peter, that's easy. Look at your Hamiltonian. I mean, if you change in the Hamiltonian from A to minus A and from A decker to minus A decker, then you see that the Hamiltonian has not changed at all. So you have an identical Hamiltonian. And of course, you're going to break the symmetry then. And so this is a simple C2 symmetry, the easiest symmetry I can think of, because there are only two values, plus or minus, or left or right. And, uh, and the question is, uh, can we detect this? Uh, so sorry, not... five minutes. Very good, yes, thank okay. you. So what we did, uh, we repeated um, uh, the following run as much as possible on a single day. So create a superfluid under identical preparation steps for cooling and trapping. Excite the briefing mode using the same kick all the time, which means that AD is fixed. Then image the superfluid after some time, 250 times within one millisecond interval. And this allows us to extract from the images both the oscillation of the drive and of the high order mode. And then from the two, we can extract the amplitude and the phase lag between the actual mode and the drive. And so if we make a histogram then of the real and the imaginary part of our space time crystal, then it really looks like this. So here on the left, you see the, uh, the phase time crystal, the, its amplitude, and you can see they're bunched in two parts, phase equals zero, phase equal pi. And if we look at the, the phase lag, then you see that uh, then nearly equal, 69 times we, we find phase equals zero, and 71 times we, phase, we find the phase equals pi. So we think that this uh, symmetry is really broken uh, spontaneous. Of course, we can do the simulation as well. So uh, we did some semi-classical analysis of the uh, of the, uh, the system, and there you see that we can get very good agreement with our experiment. Also bunched in two bunches with uh, 74 out of 66 uh, phase equal zero and phase equal pi. So from that, uh, we believe that uh, that they are perfect in agreement with the simulation. So. At the same time, this, uh, this, uh, this, these nice uh, uh, experiments also uh, allow us uh, to further confirm our discrete time crystal by looking at the, the period doubling 
of the uh, space-time crystal with respect to the drive, and we find that the period is really doubled with, uh, well, within 0 0.003 within two. So it means that uh, we have a very good agreement with, uh, with this space-time crystal. Okay, let's um, go to the conclusions. So the actual mode is really uh, breaks down the uh, discrete time symmetry of the, of the drive. The discrete time symmetry is broken in a spontaneous way. And the phase diagram predicts uh, the presence of the time crystal. And we really would like to explore this phase diagram in more detail. The outlook is um, how can we explore that? We're also thinking about uh, what can we do to this linear superposition? Can we make pi of two pulses? Uh, can we really uh, engineer this system uh, in, in a more clever way? And we're thinking about ways to do that. And then we would like to see how in our modulated system we can make excitations and see how they evolve. And with that, um, I would thank you, like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, nice talk. So now there is time for questions. Please raise your hands. Uh, so that, then I, I can start. Oh, OK, so there is a question by. Christoph, uh, go ahead. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I would like to, uh, concerning stability and uh, lack of, of thermalization of discrete time crystals, we are always looking for some signature of integrability. For example, in the many body uh, localization, uh, for the time crystal with the many body localization, we know that they are local integrals of, integral of motion. In case of uh, uh, bosons bouncing on a mirror, we know that this uh, system can be actually for two to one resonance can be mapped to the Lipkin Meshkov Big model, static Lipkin Meshkov Big model, because this is in the time periodic basis. And of course, we know that 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 uh, that this is uh, actually Lipkin Meshkov Big model is the same as spin system with uh, in uh, with all to all infinite interact uh, with, with all to all interactions and again this is integrable and also in the angelo uh, talk we have seen that the initial system is again lipkin meshkov glig model which is integrable and then it is periodically driven and of course it is also uh, somehow the, is related to the question by by to the comment by audit concerning if it is one body or a few body uh, time crystals, because all of them can be can be considered as a, let's say, spin system within the lipkin meshkov glig model. But now my question, my question is, can you identify what kind of integrability is uh, responsible for the stability of, 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 of your time space crystals? Of course, if we forget about uh, uh, atomic losses, because that is, this is, mm -hmm. Well, that's a very difficult uh, question for an experimentalist, I guess. Um, what we know about our system is the, that we can do this rotating wave approximation. And therefore, the, the Hamiltonian becomes time independent and we're in a, in a so-called uh, pre-thermal phase. Uh, of course, the, the question is, how good is this rotating wave approximation? And, and we don't. Second thing is that uh, we created our superfluid and this superfluid is uh, there's still always a, a thermal component. In our case, it's very, very small, but it's still there. So this also gives us uh, damping in the system. Um, but in our model, we have this uh, fourth order parameter which uh, takes this all into account. And what we can do is we can actually determine this parameter from our experiments. And then we, it, we discovered that this parameter is very, very small. So. Uh, it's in the order of 10 minus four. So it's so much more, uh, so much more smaller than all the other parameters in our system that, that we know that our system is very stable. Uh, and that's also what we observe. So Thank you. I guess that, that uh, let's say theoretically, the stability can be related, am I, am I right? Related to the, to the uh, validity of the rotating wave, wave, wave approximation. Right, mm -hmm. right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and of course, uh, this is, uh, of course, one, one could be able to calculate that, but this is also what we observe, of course, in the experiment. And because 
if the rotating wave approximation would break down, then we would see heating on our system and then we would quickly uh, dissipate our crystal. Okay, thank you. More questions? So I, I, I can ask one myself. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, the transition might be either second order or first order, at least, from, right? So right. it's experimentally possible to see, really, for this yes. first order. Yes. You have this kind of sensibility. Uh, yes, or... well, we, 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 did, we didn't really look at the, so far, at uh, changing the, the drive parameter. We keep the drive parameter always constant. Uh, but our next experiment would be just to to change the drive parameter and see whether we can we can cross this uh, this, this phase transition. And the tuning is something we we, we can tweak because uh, this is depends on the drive frequency with respect to the uh, to the mode frequency. So if we change that, then we can look for the system at in in for positive detuning and negative detuning, and then see what the difference will be. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see no more questions, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, all the speaker. On the, oh, sorry, there is. Oh, yeah. So this of this clapping. So thanks a lot. So we have a break now, and uh, so we resume at eleven uh, for the second part of this morning session. So, so see you later.
Christoph, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so when I when uh, I click ask to unmute, what do you see? Because I, I don't know. Do you get a permanent signal uh, warning or how does it work? Uh, actually, uh, I I don't know because I probably I unmute myself. So ah, that, okay, okay. That is I, I didn't see. Let's say. Yeah, there was, there was something, there was something, but you know, I was just a bit, you know. No, uh, that's fine, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I click ask to unmute to Anna Rossi, the next speaker. Okay, uh, let's do it. I, I, I mute and let, uh, try me unmute, okay? Okay. I clicked. Do you see anything? Yes, I got, there was a small window appeared asking me to accept. Uh, ah, okay. okay. So this is, should be fine. Hi, I remember you that you are live streamed. Oh, that, that was very important. Thank you, sir. Please let me know when I should stop the sharing of the slide. Oh. I think we can stop so that we have a few minutes. Uh... Okay, grazie. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Yeah. Uh, so if Anna and uh, Adrian are present, we can try the connection already. Okay, I, I say. Okay. Okay, good. So I think you can start sharing the screen. I think there are a few minutes uh, we should wait, but better too. So I, I will also ask to unmute Adrian. And Maybe Adrian starts um, because he would start. Well, whatever, you, you decide. I mean, so you have 20 minutes in total, including questions. So you should be. Uh, the, the first is Ling Zen Guo and then Anna and... Ah, sorry. Yes. Okay. So sorry. my mistake. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought... Okay. So I apologize. It was my mistake. I was... Okay. So I look for... Okay. <clears throat> Okay, Hello. sorry, LinkedIn, sorry. Hi, Hi. May, may you share the screen? Okay, I, I can share my screen. This one. Okay. Uh, we just wait a couple of more minutes, okay? And we start okay. at 11 sharp. Thank you. 
Okay, so Christoph, I think LinkedIn, I think we can start. So let's start. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good evening, good day, everybody, for the second part of this morning session. So, the pleasure, I just leave the floor to next speaker, LinkedIn Guo from Erlangen. Please. Uh, okay. We'll Thank yeah. you. 25 Thank you. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad to have this chance to share my work. Uh, I come from Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light from Germany. So today my topic will be topological phase space latest waves. Um, so I will talk about uh, several topics like uh, Fluquet time crystals, phase space crystals, uh, phase space latest waves. So let's Start from the question, what is the Flaquet time crystal? From my understanding, Flaquet time crystal is robust subharmonic modes in closed quantum systems. So if you want to create, create the Flaquet time crystal, the first step is to uh, spontaneously break the discrete time translation symmetry. Now there are currently there are two kinds of models. One is oscillators like quantum gas, and the other is the other model is spins, two-level systems. In both models, we need to periodically uh, drive this system. Let's say your driving frequency is omega d, uh, but uh, if your system responds at a fraction fraction of the driving frequency, uh, driving frequency omega d over n, n is integer. Uh, larger than one, then you say we have a uh, subharmonic modes. And these subharmonic modes, uh, they usually they, they, they appear in multiplet. Let's say uh, here I mark uh, these subharmonic modes. They oscillate with the same fractional uh, frequency, but uh, they differ from their driving, uh, their oscillation phases. Uh, this subharmonic modes actually is already known for quite a long time. In classical system, in nonlinear science, but for closed quantum system, there are two main problems. The Schrodinger equation is linear, so so there is no nonlinearity. And also, we know that for a generic quantum system, the driving will heat the closed system to infinity temperature, and this means that uh, your subharmonic mode in quantum system is unstable. And then uh, the second step is that you need to stabilize your system. So the first uh, proposal is by, uh, is using, is introducing the disorders, the uh, many volume localization. Uh, this is already the taking off of Fluke time crystals. Then people introduce more and more mechanism like pre-thermal state, dissipation, nonlinearity from mean field and also the RMG model, many, many. So um, this is the, the Fluke time crystal. Then what is the phase space time, uh, phase space crystal? So let's say you have a system and you periodic driving, the system can potentially have many subharmonic modes. Uh, let's write this, this subharmonic modes in a different way with the quadratures X, I, and P, I, and we can label these subharmonic modes according to the quadrature space. X and P, they are actually conjugate variables. They are in their phase space. Uh, in some special case, maybe these subharmonic modes can arrange in an ordered uh, way. So I call the ordered state of Lucas time crystals in phase space. It's a phase space crystal. Uh, the phase space crystal is not identical to the Lucas time crystal. They have a, a large overlay uh, to study, like, uh, to study the condensed matter physics of Fluquet time crystals in phase space. But uh, you can also 
Uh, you have also studied the condensed matter physics of liquid time crystals in time in purely time dimension uh, dimensions. And uh, uh, actually, uh, for phase space crystals, the time translational symmetry breaking is not a, a necessary condition. I meaning you can also study the uh, interaction of uh, uh, subharmonic modes without uh, um, time translational symmetry breaking. So anyway, so if you want to create, uh, if, if you want to have a, a phase space crystal, in you you need to create the latest potential in phase space. Let's say you want to uh, potential like cosine p plus cosine x. As we know that for the uh, particles, you normally you only have a p square or a linear p. So there's uh, no such kind of uh, a uh, highly nonlinear term uh, as function of momentum. So how do you get it? Uh, actually, there are already a nice model uh, uh, called kicked harmonic oscillator. This I already know for quite a long time. And it's just a, a simple harmonic oscillator with a, a cosine lattice potential, but this is the cosine latent potential is stroboscopic, meaning you turn on and turn off this cosine potential periodically, it's a kicking. So you can kick your harmonic oscillator several times during one time period. And this is called a kicking number, kick knot. So for example, you can kick it four times. Uh, and uh, we consider the weak driving limit meaning that your driving, your kicking strength is still much, much uh, uh, weak. And uh, your system, your oscillator is still dominant by the fast harmonic oscillation. But uh, their quadratures, X and P, or their amplitude and phases are slowly, slowly changed by the kicking, uh, by the kicking. So we are interested in the slow dynamics of these quadratures X and P. Actually, if you choose the kicking number is four, you can exactly have this uh, Hamiltonian you want. Uh, we actually e extend this kicked harmonic uh, uh, oscillator to a more general way. So to create a, a honeycomb lattice structure in phase space. So here you can use three kind of uh, stroboscopic lattice and they are turn on and turn off at a different time instance here as I showing here. And at each time, uh, kicking time instance, the lattice, the kicking strength and the lattice wave vector and also the uh, phase can, can be different, you need to tune it. If you uh, do this kind of stroboscopic lattice driving like, uh, uh, like uh, this way, as I shown in this figure, and you can exactly create a, a honeycomb lattice in phase space. And in principle, any arbitrary phase space lattice can be synthesized by multiple stroboscopic lattice driving. Uh, okay, now we go to the many body Hamiltonian. Let's say uh, if you drive, if you drive simultaneous a lot, a lot of particles. So these particles uh, um, can occupy to this lattice size of honeycomb lattice. Uh, they are actually the uh, the the, uh, the attractors or the stable points. They will be localized here. Uh, but uh, of course, in real experiments, they can have some kind of interaction. So the question is that, uh, what is the interaction? The, what is the effective interaction on their quadratures or in phase space? Uh, this question actually has been solved by, um, by these works. So uh, imagine that you have a, you have a real space interaction between two particles. Actually, every time period, they will oscillate and collide with each other. And the effective interaction on their quadratures is the time average of their real space interaction. This is very simple, and it's also intuitive. 
Uh, but a, a little surprisingly is that uh, this effective interaction is only depends on the phase space distance as I introduced here. For example, for the cold atoms, the real space interaction is described by contact interaction, meaning these two atoms only feel each other when they are contact each other. And if you use this formula, you will find that the effective interaction in phase space is actually a cooling-like interaction. It's a long range interaction now. So in this work, we will focus in this, uh, in this special case of cold atoms. Okay, now we have phase space crystals, yeah? Now you can imagine that you excited these atoms around their equilibrium, uh, early around their equilibrium point, may they may be oscillate in uh, they may be form uh, uh, a pattern in real space. It's phase space lattice waves, yeah. Because uh, if you zoom each atom, you will see that uh, actually they will uh, oscillate around their equilibrium point. But their oscillation phase, you will see, can see here, they may, feel, they may form some kind of a wave pattern. This is what I call the phase space lattice waves. And uh, you can, uh, so these atoms has a displacement along X direction and also has a small displacement along P direction. Here, you should, uh, uh, you should pay attention that uh, these two directions now are conjugate directions. So you can introduce a ladder operator like this. Yeah? Uh, then you can do the Taylor expansion to the seventh order, then get an effective uh, uh, Hamiltonian about uh, phase space lattice waves. Yeah? So the first line is on site terms. And this term just meaning the rotating frequency of these atoms around their equilibrium point. And these two squeezing terms just tell you that uh, this orbit you can see here, maybe they are not a perfect circle, they're kind of elliptical uh, circle, yeah? This is called squeezing. Uh, of course, because of this long range interaction, they also have uh, offsite interaction. So this one, H L L prime is, is the hopping, it's a hopping term. Uh, here I want to uh, stress on that uh, here, uh, lattice excitation hop, the atom, the, uh, the atom do not hop. So you should pay attention. So the atoms are localized, are always localized around their equilibrium point. And uh, of course, this lattice excitation can also have some offside squeezing terms here, as I show you here. Uh, yeah, and we can calculate actually analytically this uh, hopping term and this uh, offside uh, squeezing term. Uh, so it is interesting that um, the direct hopping term from this and this, this direct hopping term are real numbers. So there's no hopping, there's no complex uh, hopping phase. Uh, but the squeezing, but squeezing set term, you will see that they can have some uh, complex uh, phases. Yeah. And uh, the squeezing terms can introduce a longer, uh, um, a longer distance hopping. Let's say if you have some squeezing between L and L bar, and also L bar and L prime, that can induce uh, effective hopping between L and L prime. And this is given by this. And this is meaning that if you imagine that if you hop, around a closed triangle, you will actually acquire some kind of complex phases. Uh, but at the same time, because the direct hopping along a unit cell is zero, this meaning that uh, this uh, offside squeezing terms creates an effective, uh, effective staggered magnetic fields. And actually this is uh, the, key, uh, the key ingredient of uh, anonymous quantum heart effects uh, introduced by Hodan many, many years ago. So effectively we have uh, staggered magnetic fields. 
Okay, then I can show you the topological band structures. I diagonalize my Hamiltonian using the Bogolubov uh, transformation. Here, this is the bosonic uh, Bogolubov transformation. So to keep this uh, bosonic uh, non-commutation relationship, uh, and for weak interaction, you will see here, this is actually very similar to the uh, anonymous quantum heart effects. So uh, you, uh, you have a Dirac, uh, Dirac Kuhn like structure and also has a small gap here opened by, by the complex squeezing terms. Um, but if you go to the strong interaction, this is a non perturbative regime, uh, which is uh, far away from uh, the uh, anonymous quantum heart effects. So the gap can be very, very large. So I can calculate actually the train number of each band as a function of the interaction strength and also as a function of on-site detuning. Here, the on-site detuning meaning that uh, you can also lift the degeneracy of this K and the K prime symmetry points. So you can lift this. Uh, then you can see here, uh, this green region are, uh, are, are, trivial, are trivial band uh, structures. And if you introduce a stronger interaction, you will go to here, uh, non-topological, uh, you can hear non-trivial topological band, uh, band structures. Uh, and also we found that uh, uh, interestingly, you can also have additional regime here uh, with uh, between number is two and, and minus two. Uh, so I, this, uh, this regime is uh, uh, it's a new regime which uh, does not appear in the anonymous quantum heart effect uh, introduced by Hodan. Uh, and also you can see here, uh, in, if your interaction strong is a, it's a stronger than some critical points, your system become unstable. And uh, this is because I use this uh, Bogolubo for bosoning Bogolubo transformation. This eigenfrequency can be complex. So uh, if they are, they, if they are be, if, if these frequencies become complex, they become unstable. Yeah. Uh, okay, here I will show you a topological edge state. Now I introduce a boundary here along p direction, this is the boundary, this is the boundary. But along x direction, I still use the periodic boundary conditions. And this is the band structure. You can clearly see uh, topological edge bands across the gaps. And the color, I use the color to meaning to indicate the average position of this edge state. So you can see here for this band, for this band, this meaning you, are uh, on the upper edge. And for this uh, edge band, for this edge band, you are uh, on, on the lower edge. Yeah. So they, they propagate uh, uh, along different directions. The, this is a uh, very similar, this is actually the quantum heart effect. Uh, here I show you that uh, uh, the robust edge states in, in a totally open, in a totally open uh, uh, boundary then, meaning there's no periodic boundary along P and X direction. You will see a disc-like uh, shape, uh, a disc-like uh, shape here. And here, this is the, uh, the eigenspectrum of your, uh, of your system. And uh, this region is topological non, it's topological edge state region. I excited a wave package here. Then I will show you an animation how this uh, topological wave package will move. So you can see here, they're just uh, circling around, around this, uh, this edge. Uh, even, even you see there are some kind of defects. They are not uh, propagate, they're not uh, scattered back. They just surround this, uh, this, uh, uh, this defect and going, and going on. To see it clearly, I can also show you the space-time plot of this web package. I project, I project this web package on the uh, spatial dimension, uh, meaning their average position in their, in their x dimension. You can see clearly this topological 
edge state just uh, propagates um, very robust. As a comparison, uh, you can also excite a non-topological edge state. Here, then you will see that uh, this uh, non-topological edge state will just uh, quickly uh, scatter the back and also maybe spread inside this, uh, uh, this bark. Uh, the, this is unstable. So let's ask, uh, uh, let, let me ask a very interesting uh, question. Uh, does our system uh, have, has the time reversal symmetry? The time reversal symmetry uh, uh, sorry, yeah. you have five five minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I only have two slides now. Okay. So, uh, the time reversal symmetry is broken for this effective model. This is very clear. I showed you because we have small gap near the Dirac point uh, from this uh, from this uh, offside squeezing terms. But at the same time, it's interesting that uh, our original Hamiltonian, you can see here. This is the time reversal invariant. If you do this uh, time uh, reversal operation, because our honeycomb single particle uh, honeycomb lattice is uh, uh, symmetric around uh, with respect to P, and also the phase space interaction doesn't change on this. So it's quite interesting that um, uh, we have two kind of time reversal symmetry. One is from the effective model; the other is from the physical model. So notice that uh, the time reversal operation for phase space crystals is actually a non-local transformation. Yeah, and this meaning that you cannot uh, find a local transformation, local uh, anti-unitary transformation to cancel these uh, phases, but you can use this kind of non-local time reversal transformation to cancel it. Yeah, so let's compare uh, uh, the phase space crystal to the quantum Haar effect, uh, anonymous quantum Haar effect, and the spin Haar effect. You can see the time reversal symmetry. Uh, the quantum Haar effect, anonymous quantum, uh, quantum Haar effect, they have no uh, time reversal symmetry. The spin Haar effects, they have uh, time reversal symmetry, but because it's for spins, it's minus one. But for our system, uh, we have a time we have a physical time reversal symmetry, which is uh, which is the positive one. But the effective model here, uh, we have no time reversal symmetry. And the pseudo, do we need a pseudo magnetic uh, field? So uh, the quantum Haar effects uh, and anonymous quantum Haar effect they need, but uh, the anonymous quantum effect needs a staggered magnetic uh, staggered magnetic field. The spin Haar effects uh, there are no. Uh, additional magnetic fields. Here for phase space crystals, we don't need additional uh, uh, magnetic fields, but uh, we can have effective uh, scatter, staggered magnetic field from the interaction, from the squeezing. So, okay, so uh, the quantum Haar effects, uh, another quantum Haar effect, and, all, and our phase space crystal, there's no pseudo spins or spins, but uh, spin Haar effects that have spins and edge states. So, uh, quantum Haar effects, uh, anonymous quantum Haar effect, and our phase space crystal is chiral. Uh, but spin Haar effect, they are uh, helical. This is meaning that if you do the um, uh, time reverse transformation, you also change the uh, chirality. But for our system, even you change, even you do the time reversal symmetry operation, you still have a chiral, chiral uh, edge state. So uh, the, the same kind of edge states. So we see that our model is very interesting. Uh, but if you uh, just look at the effective model, our model is more close to the anonymous quantum Haar effect, uh, which we call the chain insulate. Okay, so a summary, we investigate the lattice waves of a crystal in phase space with the honeycomb lattice. We studied the, the topological effects from the many body dynamics with the long range cooling like interaction. Uh, phase space crystals spots chain like, chain insulate like topological phases, uh, which is actually in two, two dimensional system with broken time reversal symmetry. But our model is a 1D system with time reversal symmetry. So it, this is quite interesting. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for. Uh... Uh, your presentation, and so th there is already a question from Thomas Fischer. So, okay. I, have a, I have a question. Go ahead. 
Yeah, your your edge in uh, phase space is an edge of a very strange uh, momentum in experiments. What would I look for, or what does an edge mean in 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 real phase space? Uh, in real phase space, I think. Uh, um, this is a straw book. You you can see here. Uh, if you can, if in the experiment, if in the experiment you can measure simultaneously the x and the p, then maybe you can plot <coughs> this. You can plot this in the phase space. Uh, you can define the edge. Um, but if you cannot, if it's difficult, you can just measure the average uh, position. The mm -hmm. average position of uh, your local web package. This can also show the topological edge states. But uh, I'm, I mean that uh, this edge is that this XP is actually the real uh, moment coordinate and the momentum at a stroboscopic time. So if you, uh, if you measure your system stroboscopic X and P, you will have this, you will have this uh, uh, edge in phase space. Yeah, but I think okay. it's the, mm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I mean, there are other questions, so that's why I was. <clears throat> so I think the next uh, is Oded, please. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the very nice talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand correctly from your uh, time kicks, you managed to get uh, you know, a discretization in momentum as well as in your position. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, each of your attractors now in phase space uh, will be localized in space, but will also have uh, some quasi-localized momentum. If I think of, about such a re representation of a coordinate in phase space, I would say that this would have a very well-identified Fox state number. Fox state number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in that sense, you're, you're generating some sort of a lattice between Fox states. And, and so I would uh, say that it's probably also related to the topic of this conference that you can generate uh, this translation symmetry breaking either with spin or spin-like uh, contributions or with time-dependent kicks. And there are works, I don't know if you're aware of it, by Dawei Wang, Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually did similar uh, Fox space uh, topology mm -hmm. in uh, with James Cummings uh, kicked models. So I would I would probably think that it would yeah. be very interesting so, uh, to make a connection yeah. between this uh, uh, phase space lattice and the Fox space. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I connection. think I know I, I know this works from the synthetic dimensions. I think you are mentioning some works from there. Um, it, so I mean, effectively, you have a synthetic dimension, but the Daiwei Wang took it works took it to deep quantum, and and they actually connected the the lattice nodes on on between Fox states. Yeah, and in some sense, your your lattice is going to have well given Fox numbers. Uh, okay, good. So thank you for your um, I think I will check some work about this. Uh, yes, it's, it's kind of um, uh, related, but I also want to uh, emphasize that our model, actually uh, the quantum is not the essential ingredient for our system. Our system can also be a pure, uh, purely classical system. So we, we, so you can actually, uh, so this complex phase, phases I showed you here is not related to any quantum thing. It's yeah, only, I understand. You, you, yeah. you have your fluctuation spectrum around the tractors in phase space, and they, uh, if you take higher order, when they will start start to hybridize and excite between the attractors. I, this I understand. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. So there much. is a yeah. There is a last uh, last question by Jamir Marino. Jamir, go yes, ahead. Thank you so much. So just a quick question about terminology. You talk about the squeezing terms, right? A daga L, A daga L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually I tend to think about squeezing when L is equal to L prime. So normally this term, I'm gonna squeeze the boson, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So now, should I imagine that your state is a sort of spatial extension of a squeezed state, that you have modes, a K non zero, that get squeezed by the term, or you are just using a terminology to, to convey quickly what these A dag, A dag are? Okay, maybe I should, uh, yeah, maybe this squeezing is not a uh, good uh, terminology. So I just, okay. maybe it's, uh, we can call it the two, two phonon process, is something like that. It's a in, it's two phonon process, two phonon. Maybe uh, so. In, uh, other, maybe in other words, this term is producing any interesting entanglement, any interesting spatial result that's squeezing in your problem, or it is just producing pair of photon correlated pair of photons on different sides. I mean, do, do, did you did you look at the state somehow? Uh, I think in my model, it's in my current model is only used to uh, to excite the two phonons at different sites. It, uh, it's not yet uh, related to the entanglement or something like that, but it will be our future work to look at this. Uh, here, it's just uh, you excited the two phonons or you uh, kill two phonons at different uh, lattice sites. Yeah, um, okay, thanks. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much. I think okay. we should uh, move on. Thank you. And uh, we move to the next talk given by Anna Rossi and Adrian Ernst. Uh, who's starting first? I mean, they share this talk. Uh, it's about adiabatic, adiabatic classical discrete time crystal. Uh, Adrian is starting, yes. So you have, let's say, 17, 18 minutes, a couple of minutes for discussion, please. Go ahead. I think you have five. OK. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, welcome to our talk um, about adiabatic classical discrete time crystals. And I will talk about theory and some simulations, and Anna will later talk about our experiments. So to start, um, we have a variable x, and x is composed of hc and xa. And hc is the variable we have under our external control, and it is on a sphere, and we call this um, sphere, it is, on, um, is our control space. And then we have XA, and XA responses to the dynamics of HC, and it is in a space we call action space. So X in, X in total is in C cross A. Um, so if you look again at A, we have a symmetry operator SA. And the symmetry, if applied to A, um, mirrors the point. But if we apply um, SA to HC, um, nothing will happen. So, as, so our full, full dynamics is in C cross A. So we will take a close look at it. Um, and here we will show it as a Cartesian space, but in reality, it is much more complex. So we need projections to our control space and to our action space, um, and we will call them pi. Um, so now that we can see what, what we can do and what will happen, um, we will define a potential U. Um, and it depends on X. And um, this potential as well is um, symmetric. So if we apply the symmetry operator um, to, to X, um, it only is applied to the um, extra space. So now um, we're driving very slow our system. So that means we're driving adiabatically. And that also means that um, we don't have any kinetic energy. So the potential U is our total energy. And that also means that um, in action space, we are usually in the minimum um, um, of the potential U. So we want to know where is our minimum. So we will define a um, stationary manifold in C cross A. And stationary manifold describes all stationary points. And so we can define it by the um, gradient of u equals zero. 
And if you now plot this um, st stationary manifold um, in our um, C cross A space, we can see it's quite complex and it's topologically not um, trivial. But now we have not only minima, but also maxima and other stationary points. So we will um, paint our stationary manifold such that we have different regions. And if we take a closer look, we have the green regions, um, which are the minima, the red regions, which are the maxima, and between the minima and the maxima, we have fences. So now we are only invest in the minima, minima because we are always in the um, minimum in our system. So we will change our perspective. And now on the left, again, the control space, on the right is the action space. So we will start on the stationary manifold at the point X star. And um, we just make a small loop um, in the minimum region here. So this loop, um, like this is a closed pass and um, the, this pass is topologically trivial. So we contract, can contract it to a point. And it also means that in the action space, we just have a small oscillation around X um, star A. And after a closed um, pass on M, we return to the original point. And if we project this um, pass to C, we will see we have a closed loop which starts at HC and ends at, at HC. So um, now we can think what happens if we apply the symmetry operation MSA um, on this X star. So we end up down there. And now we can start making a pass um, from the X star to the symmetry point. So we will make this pass and then we project it again. Um, if we project it to um, A, we can see that um, we um, transition from X star A to its um, symmetry point. But as the symmetry operator does not, not um, do anything on C, we um, see that we get a closed loop. So the starting point is the ending point. Um, so now we can make another um, pass so we can close the loop. And we will do this by um, mirroring this pass by applying SA to the pass. So then we have a closed loop in M. And as expected in A, um, we go again back to X star A. Um, but on C, as, as A again doesn't do anything, we get the same um, driving loop. So that basically means um, if we drive our system in C two times identical, we get um, the first time we transition to another point and the second time we transition back to the um, original point. So we have built a time crystal. And if we now look back again in the middle, um, we have this pass, and because it's a topological thing, we can contract it. But if we contract it, we will end um, here at this region, and um, the pass will still wind around this region. So this pass is non, not topological trivia. And that also means that in our driving space, um, C, it cannot be trivial topologically. And as you can see here, we have this projection of the fences. And um, we basically wind around. So that means that if we wind around this fence point, um, we will get a time crystal. So now we want to make such a system. So we start with a simple nut. And um, in this nut, um, we put three spheres, which are now our action coordinates. And for driving, we use a wrench, obviously. And we rotate the nut by 60 degrees each. And after each driving, we put a sphere again. Um, and we drive the system adiabatically um, as well, so very slow. And if you look at the side, um, we can see we transition up. Um, and so the c-axis equals the time. But the actual speed of driving does not make a difference because it's purely ge geometric as physics. And if we now cut out a unit cell, um, of our created structure, we see that it's a hexagonal closed packed structure. And it has two um, atoms per unit cell. 
So the total height of the unit cell is T response, and it equals two times um, the time of one wrench driving. So again, we have a time crystal. Um, but this system is um, like a very fixed system. So um, we will make a system which is like more self-assembled. So we will, will replace the nut um, by three particles. These are paramagnetic particles. And um, they are like have dipolar interactions between each other. And um, they are above, above a magnetic lattice. And then we have the wrench and we replace it by an external homogeneous magnetic field. We can modulate the time. So that's our driving. So if you take a closer look at the system, we see in red the dipole interactions. And below we see the um, single particle potential um, in, for the pattern. So we here we are the minimum. Um, as, of the potential and we have the dipole interactions um, which keep the particles in a distance and they all have the same strengths and the distance between the particles is the same but if we now tilt um, the magnetic field um, the strengths of the dipole interaction changes um, and some get weaker and some um, keep stronger so they get closer together and if we now make um, an azimuthal uh, modulation, then we have a rotational force on this group of particles. And if the tilt is high enough, then the particle is locked to the modulation of the external field. So we did simulations on this, um, and we start with the nose here um, to the left. So if we make one simple loop, you can see we will rotate here, and we turn in a different conformation. And if we make the same modulation loop um, again, then we will um, return at this um, start confirmation. So we have again made um, a time crystal. And we saw what happens if we couple many of these time crystals and we start with a ferromagnetic order. And you can see here um, between these two um, particles, there's quite a low distance and could be larger. So it's not optimal energetically and we start driving this loop and this loop goes near a fence point. So that means that at some point, because of fluctuations, we get a defect. And this defect also changes the fence point of the neighboring um, time crystals. So at some point, we will get an anti-ferromagnetic anti order. And this order will persist in time. So every um, time crystal makes time crystal, but the anti-ferromagnetic order will persist because it's energetically now better because these particles here are further away from each other. So now Anna will talk to you something about the experiments. So, <clears throat> do you hear me? Yeah. For the experimental setup, um, we made um, a flower-like magnet. And on top of that, we put three spheres so that they can move. Here you see a top view of the actual pattern, which is used in the experiments. And on top, there are placed three steel spheres of a diameter um, of seven millimeters, which is pretty big. So we have a, a macroscopic setup here. And we put this pattern in the um, in a um, um, homogeneous external magnetic field, which is um, produced by two permanent magnets, um, which are aligned parallel to each other and at a constant distance. So now, and this external magnetic field can be moved freely around the pattern. So in, in the experiment here, you see um, the dotted lines um, marks the position of the magnets under the luminous sand film. And due to parallax error, um, the spheres seem to not be centered, but they actually are. And the video will be marked whenever the external magnetic field is perpendicular to the pattern. 
So let's start the movie. Here we see that we uh, make a um, loop with an opening angle of 60 degrees, like you can um, see on the upper right. Um, <clears throat> so we make this loop and they started in the red position. And after we um, have this one loop, we see that they will end in another position, in the blue position. So we, we see that after one loop, um, they end up um, at a different position. And when, now when we um, make the same loop again, the same loop, opening angle of 60 degrees, so we move around one fence point, um, then we see that the spheres will actually end at the first at red, at red position. So we see that we have a time crystal here, which is pretty nice and pretty good fitting. And then um, when we make a loop that winds around two fence points, so with an opening angle of 120 degrees, we um, see what happens. And um, yeah, you're going pretty slow. So um, we will see that they go around 120 degrees and they actually come back to the same position. So they, here we do not have a time crystal. And we can go on and on and always repeat this loop and they will always come back to the red positions. Um, so, so we see um, that we can make a topological trivial non-time crystal. We can do a topological non-trivial non uh, time crystal, which was in the first video. And we can do a topological non-trivial non-time crystal like you see in the second video, which is pretty nice actually. So thank you for your attention and now you can ask a lot of questions, hopefully. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, like, yeah, there is all dead. Go ahead. I, I, I said they actually they, clapped, but I can also ask. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, you just raised the hand. I, I raised I mean, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, ah, okay, sorry. Uh, but I can still ask. So would you say that you are actually realizing what Angela was uh, presenting to us this morning, that you have a, a magnetic symmetry breaking in your system, and now with your uh, protocol on how you move, you actually uh, pass the system from one attractor to the other, and by this you therefore obtain your... Uh, <laughs> so-called time crystal. I, I, I don't know if you attended the talk in the morning. Um, yes, but I didn't really understand what you, like you are saying that. I mean, you, you have a symmetry breaking that has this, it's what you call fence modes, right? It's, it comes from your, from your magnetic potential effectively. And now through your protocol, you're, you're activating transition from one to the other. Yes. And that's the, the time it takes you to do it, it is the time that it takes you to do it. But then because of the inherent uh, identifiable attractors in your you know, magnetic potential, you are then getting to, to repeat only every second time back to your position. So I would say that this is effectively what Angela was telling yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, it was looking very similar. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, more questions? Oh, Christoph, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, you consider, for example, free particle system, which is uh, periodically driven. And in principle, this is enough degrees of freedom to observe chaotic behavior. Of course, I guess that you are in the regime where the dynamic is irregular. But on the other hand, as far as I understood, 
uh, you have behind you have topology, which uh, ensures that you can observe this crystalline structure. And my question is, if you, uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's possible, but if you if you change the parameters and you drive the system strongly, can you can your this uh, discrete time crystals can be still protected by the underlying topological properties, or it is. Um, what do you mean by striving it strongly? Okay, I, yeah, like, you. Uh, what? Uh, what? As, as far as I understand, you need the system to, to to drive the system sufficiently slowly. Yes. Right. Exactly. And maybe it is. It it, it excludes. You know the possibility to drive the system sufficiently strongly to have uh, to observe chaotic dynamics, and and then of course it is it is this question is not uh, relevant. But my question is that you have you have some topological properties, and topological properties can help you whatever you do. You let's say your let's say the property you are looking for can be pro can be protected by topology. So my question, simple question, if you start to, let's say, to drive a system that your dynamics is probably not, not uh, fully regular, then if you can still see, you know, discrete time crystals protected by topology or this is totally different regime? And... Um, up to, like if we drive it very fast, it won't work, obviously. But if we drive it slowly and we have some like deviations in our driving or in the, um, um, potential, it will still work. So it's robust yeah, again. I can a little bit. Um, if you drive the system faster or if you have more dissipation, the fence, uh, the projection of the fence will no longer be a point in control space, but will widen. And as soon as it widens such uh, your path cuts the fence, then you get problems. Then you will have a topological transition to a different state, and uh, it can be different. Then it's no longer robust. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. But, but there uh, are um, actually some regions. So you you do not have to drive it really really slow, but you can um, go a little bit faster since they, they widen and then you know um, that they, they should be there and they widen and you can go around too, even if you go a little bit faster than like forever slow. So there's a, a, a range where you can, for in the experiments, they, since it's robust, you can um, like go a little bit faster than uh, you can, um, change it a little bit. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I, I guess 